Uh, today we will discuss a symmetrical relationship using Taiwan as an example, but, uh, but not limited to Taiwan. Um, we begin in the paper, in the readings, on um, China's policy toward Myanmar, North Korea. Um, we used to discuss major power foreign policy. When we talk about asymmetrical relationship, we also primarily, in the past, in the literature, focus on the major powers fo policy toward um, a smaller power, a weaker power. Um, for China, that would mean China's neighbors because China has not really extended its uh, influence beyond its border. So we talk about asymmetrical relationship in the past. We talk about China's policy toward Myanmar, toward North Korea, toward Vietnam, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Mongolia, etc. Um, there. When we discuss asymmetrical relationship from peripheral point of view, from Vietnam point of view, from Myanmar point of view, most of the uh, studies we can gather from the literature is about current affairs. It's very policy oriented. We don't have a lot of uh, theoretical discussions on asymmetrical relationship of smaller power toward the major power. Uh, we may have a lot of uh, policy papers on that subject, but not uh, theoretical discussion. This particular reading for you this week is a theoretical discussion on how smaller power cope with major power um, um, in terms of the smaller power's sense of efficacy, if we may say that. Uh, how much control the smaller power think it can have toward relationship between uh, uh, we, uh, relationship with the major power. Uh, in the past we discussed balance of relationship. We argued that when a, when a country, when a national actor resort to something happened, someone disappear? Or maybe not. I just heard something. Uh, when a smaller power or any national actor resorts to confrontational policy, it has nothing to do with the level of its power. I think this is supposed to be very controversial um, for people who are familiar with the literature on international relations. But that's exactly our argument. The confrontation or appeasement are policy options depending upon uh, relational security. If one considers relationship being violated in a significant way, then one should resort to confrontational policy in order to signal the seriousness, the devotion to relational security regardless of the level of a power. So even a smaller power facing the stronger power, violating relationship, the smaller power should resort to confrontational policy so that a stronger power would think twice how much trouble the stronger power wants to invite in the future, even though the stronger power is stronger. But if you really have to manage smaller power uh, in the future, all the time, then it really costs uh, a lot of resources, energy of doing that. And you would also invite other power to intervene. You would provide power leverage to other uh, major actors, uh, and then they will intervene in support of the uh, weaker power along your borders. So the stronger power, in our case, China would think twice, and they would concede even though they're stronger power. So that's the thinking, that relational security is important to both smaller power and stronger power. And relational security means stabilized bilateral relationship. Okay. Now that's our argument. We've repeated this same argument over and over again. Uh, but then we want to pursue this asymmetrical relationship further by asking when a smaller power decides to resort to confrontational approach, 
what must have been the psychological mechanism enabling them to do that. Even though we say, well, smaller power will resort to confrontation, disregard uh, its uh, weaker power. But we still want to know uh, how people reach that decision, because it's not an easy decision for a weaker side. It's not a natural decision for a weaker side to resort to confrontation facing a stronger power. So when the weaker side decides, okay, it's too much that you've done this to me, you violate our trust relationship, you violate um, significantly our, um, our mutual understanding. Um, if I uh, allow you to do this, then I may not survive uh, the domestic challenge, I may not survive my relationship with some other countries. So people would think that you know you are someone uh, can be easily bullied with power. So I have to resort to confrontation. And the question is, how do we come to that decision? In this uh, week's reading, we use Taiwan as an example because <laughs> uh, we have the opportunity to conduct a uh, mass social survey um, on the issue of peace. This is not a, a study originally designed to study a symmetrical relationship. This uh, was a study originally initiated uh, to study the peace culture in Taiwan. So I would like to give you a little background of how this social survey became uh, something true. It was something interesting. It was. It was sponsored by a foundation called 21st Foundation. The foundation actually has been uh, supported uh, by a family who will have a uh, plausible presidential candidate for the KMT in the future. So the foundation would like to do something intellectual. The foundation would like to keep in touch with the population the masses of the society. So the foundation would like to start something uh, political and uh, social and to demonstrate its involvement in uh, people's uh, formation of opinion. So they would like to run a survey, something like, uh, do you uh, support uh, Taiwan independence in the future? Or do you support uh, uh, keeping the status quo? Things like that. I just happened to be uh, in the room when they discussed that. And I was murmuring and complaining about them for being so lacking creativity, asking questions or designing polls that have been um, almost similar to everyone else. Why bother doing the same poll over and over again? Why bother asking people their, their position on independence or status quo? if everyone else has been doing the same survey. What, uh, what really uh, additional things you can add to the already very rich data bank? So they were a little bit embarrassed and they asked me, what do I think? So I was like, you know, I have been very suspicious of the peace culture in Taiwan. We've been talking about peace for I don't know how many years, but never really, I don't think we, in Taiwan care about peace at all. <laughs> uh, uh, I can give you numerous examples of how we don't care about peace. For one example, that we have awarded uh, Donna Rumsfeld, the highest national award ever given to a foreigner. <laughs> I've mentioned this before, uh, on the national anniversary, 100th national anniversary of the country, uh, suggesting how we consider Donna Rumsfeld an important a person to to the country, and I consider this is a uh, uh, outright violation of peace. But then uh, I guess no one would listen to me in this country. Uh, but then uh, that just occurred to me that we didn't really care about peace. And when uh, Americans sending troops to uh, Middle East, uh, we have been hoping that our troops can join American troops as a support to show our loyalty to the United States. And I also consider that very uh, much um, uh, incompatible 
with our peace-loving uh, uh, pledge uh, made almost by all the presidents you can have in Taiwan. So I'm suspicious of the peace culture in Taiwan. So I uh, suggest to the foundation, why don't we do a survey on how people really feel about peace? We can put people in a condition so they will force to choose between either peace or something else, some other values, for example, independence and the peace. If you can choose only one of them, if you will, uh, will you go for independence or you will you go for peace? Economic parity or, or economic welfare, if they are in confrontation or incompatible with independence, which one you will go for? Um, so questions like this, will force the polars to decide how much value they will give to peace and how much weight they will give to other values. Uh, so we have designed several questions. Um, but then when I got the result, I, I look at the result, I figure out something more significant theoretically. It's not just about the peace culture. It's also about people's sense of control over relationship with China. Uh, the questions are about peace, about how people think they can control peace. What's the prosperity of peace? What they can do uh, to enhance uh, the prosperity of peace, uh, prospect of peace, I'm sorry. What they can do to enhance the prospect of peace? What instrument they have in hand in order to allow them to enhance the, the chance for peace? That's the question I originally thought I wanted to ask. But then I look at the results and I suddenly realize that the ability or people's sense of efficacy over their control over peace is an indirect indicator of how strong they think they can act against China. If they have stronger control, if they think they have stronger control over the prospect of peace, that would mean they would be willing to act strongly on China. Since they have stronger control over peace, they, they would think that China would not react in a violent or military way. So that's an indirect indicator of how much influence people think they have over asymmetrical relationship with China. So I look at all those questions and I try to figure out uh, how we can use these questions. And in order to strengthen your, your uh, impression of these questions, I want to read these 10 questions uh, which we ask uh, survey uh, in the survey. Uh, the survey is a uh, in-house survey. Usually we have, um, you know, us in Taiwan, usually we do survey through phone. We, we call people. We have this uh, uh, sample, uh, which we perhaps get from the, I don't know, in, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs, or from some other resources, or from phone book. So we have this random sampling, then, then we, uh, we call the people. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that you don't always get the people you want to get to answer these questions. For example, if you want to ask somebody who is over 40, a, a female over 40 in the house, you don't always get people to answer the question, uh, uh, female over 40 to answer the question. And sometimes even you have the housewife coming to answer the first two questions, and then her husband would grab the phone and answer the rest. How would you make the, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's hard to make something statistically meaningful out of this kind of uh, a phone survey. Um, and you have a lot of uh, 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 questions unanswered if you do phone survey, because you ask 50 questions, maybe 20 questions got answered, the 30 questions are left uh, blank. So you have a 2,000 uh, sample. But then when you run statistics, each question may have only 300 or even less than that as a valid answers. You don't really get uh, strong uh, statistic uh, uh, evidence, even though you have something in hand. 
So we don't like to run from survey. We like to do in-house survey. But imagine how much more cost <laughs> it would be if you do an in-house survey, right? If you have this um, population data from the Ministry of Internal Affairs, then you uh, run a random sampling. You pick up uh, those houses, some in the mountains, some on the seaside, you know, everywhere uh, in the countryside. Then you have to send people to the countryside, to the mountain, to the sea, to the factory in order to visit the fam family. So it's very expensive. So usually we don't do uh, in-house survey unless you have really a lot of money to do it. Uh, in the beginning, we didn't have a lot of money to conduct this survey. So we have a very creative way. I think this is a creative way. Uh, maybe some of you know that we have uh, we have run graduate level courses, degree program for, uh, for mid-career um, people in society everywhere because that's a very important source of revenue for many universities. So people start running all these kind of mid-career programs. And in all those mid-career programs, you get students who have college degrees who come from all different uh, sectors in the societies who are opinion leaders. So we decided to uh, pick up mid-career classes from different universities in different counties and do a pilot survey. Maybe 400 uh, students coming from uh, 25 classes all over the islands. So we go to 25 different Institute of Higher Education and meet one of their mid-career graduate level courses. So we get pretty good um, uh, reflection of the uh, strata, uh, so different social strata and different social sectors. Uh, primarily, these people are opinion leaders. So we think we have pretty good uh, uh, mix. And from that 400 answers, we find the 10 questions we have designed are good questions. That means you have good distribution of answers in, in different degree. You basically ask a question whether you agree or disagree. So you have a pretty good uh, distribution of uh, from strong agree to strong disagree in most of these 10 questions. And then when we get a grant, we decide to run these 10 questions uh, through the in-house survey. Uh, another reason that we cannot do phone survey is that all these questions are very complicated political questions. Uh, the past experience suggests that if you run political questions through phone survey, most of the time you don't get answers. People will say they have no opinion on that. Then you don't have any answer. You don't have uh, enough um, numbers to, for you to run uh, statistic analysis. So it's, it's very lucky for us to get a grant. So we have 1,000 in-house survey conducted. So we have over perhaps 500 uh, uh, valid answers for almost every question. Some, I think a couple of questions we have less than 500. We have maybe only 300 something as our valid question. But then in total we have 1,000 um, uh, survey answers. That gives us a pretty good foundation to run the statistic uh, uh, interaction. So I want to go through all these 10 questions so you will have a stronger impression even though some of you may have read the papers. These 10 questions comes from five pairs. Uh, but then when we ask the questions, we don't uh, ask them in pairs because we don't want to uh, alert uh, the uh, pollers that uh, these questions are related, so we kind of uh, spread them out and, and in different orders, so they would not be, uh, be alerted, uh, the, uh, the interaction between these questions. So I want to go through these questions. Um, these questions are in pairs, but then uh, they're, oh, wow. Why there is a line in between? But anyway, okay. Uh, let me go through these 10 questions, okay. The first question we ask, 
if the government conscripts people to have war with China in order to achieve independence, people have the right to deny conscription. Uh, I think we should uh, look for, whoops, we don't have the Chinese question because the questions were originally posed in Chinese. And when we asked them, of course, we asked them in Mandarin. Um, I meant to show you both the English question and the Chinese question, so you know how the question was originally framed uh, in Chinese, but then we don't have it here. But anyway, I think you should find it uh, in the paper if you have access to that. The, fir the first question is a question about pro-independence war. So, so the government would launch a war in order to achieve independence. That's a very aggressive ask. And then, uh, do people have the rights to say, no, I don't want to be conscripted? And interestingly, we have almost even um, distributed between pros and cons, you can see here. About half of the population will say, yes, you have the rights to deny conscription. Uh, but then almost half will say, no, you don't have the right to deny that. The second question is the fourth question we ask in the order of these 10 questions, which is uh, another component of the same pair. Uh, the question reads like this. If China resorts to armed unification and the government gives up fighting, the people should continue to fight by all means. Uh, this is different from the first question. First question is, um, a Taiwan's initiative of war in order to achieve peace. The, qu the second question is China launched the unification of war and the government decided not to defend. Would you defend anyway? Uh, then you see 55% of population say yes, they would uh, fight even though the government decided to give up. And the 45% say no, they would not fight if the government does not uh, decide not to fight. Uh, by the way, 55% of the population say they will fight even though the government gives up. Uh, this does not mean if China really attacked, 55% uh, of population would fight if the government gives up. But then this is their attitude. This doesn't mean their actual behavior when things really takes place. Uh, but this is their attitude. The attitude is that, well, we want to defend Taiwan, okay? The third question we ask, which is the seventh in the order, if a majority of Taiwanese expressively supports independent China will renounce the use of force as a means of unification. Uh, you can see 20%, only 20% of people have the confidence in their expressive uh, show of determination to go for independence. 80% of people say, well, you know, it doesn't matter whether you say that or not, China will not renounce the use of force. Uh, the other side of the pair is, if a majority of Taiwanese expressively supports unification, China will renounce the use of force as a means of unification. Uh, this comes out a little bit surprising because almost 45% of the population will still say no, even though the majority of the population in Taiwan supports unification, almost half of the population don't think China would give up use of force as means of unification. But then, uh, let's see, 55% of people say no, I mean, I mean 50% of people say no, China will not renounce the use of force, even though the majority of people say no, China will not renounce the use of force, even though the majority of people in Taiwan say they want to go for uh, unification. That's a little surprising. The next two questions as a pair, even if arms purchase will cause tension with China, Taiwanese should still proceed with purchase? Yes, 70% of people, almost 70% of people say yes, Taiwanese people should still purchase arms, even though that could cause problem with China. 
But then the next question is like this. If arms purchase requires a higher tax, people should still support, then you have only 33% of population say they will support for arms purchase if uh, it will take higher tax. Uh, this appears to be uh, a little uh, calculative, right? Because the support for arms purchase drop by 50% if it takes higher tax. But I think this is uh, quite uh, nominal. Uh, we will see uh, deeper um, statistic analysis later on uh, in order to show you what it really means here. The next two questions. If the ruling party is the DPP, China will not use China will not force unification. 28% of the population say, well, no, uh, it doesn't matter. Sef I'm sorry, 28% of people say yes. If the ruling party is DPP, China will not use force, will not force unification. But 72% of population say no, it doesn't really matter. The DPP as a ruling party will not help China to think twice on its unification policy through military means. The next question, if it is the DPP who carries out openness to and exchange with China, people should feel safer. 38%, 37% of population say yes, well, we feel safer if the DPP uh, be the ruling party carrying out openness to China, but 62, 63% of population say it doesn't matter. Even though it was PP, DPP in power, uh, openness to China will not um, comfort us uh, more than uh, if KMT uh, being the, the uh, ruling party. Uh, in other words, uh, do people think DPP could enhance their control over peace? Um, maybe a little bit, but then not much. The last two questions. The longer the current situation lasts, the more bargaining chips Taiwan will have with China. 34% of population say yes, they have uh, um, good prospect for Taiwan's future vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. But 66% of people are um, kind of suspicious about that. The last question, Taiwan will become independent eventually, even though China opposes. Almost half of the people say yes, and a little bit over half of the population say no, uh, maybe not. So you will see that even only 34% of population feel a little bit more confidence in uh, the future of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, there are more people think uh, Taiwan will become in independent despite uh, the uh, future um, of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China doesn't look all that uh, promising. So these are the 10 questions we've asked in the survey. Now if you look at these 10 questions, you would generally say, well, uh, people in Taiwan don't have strong control over peace. They don't have a strong advocacy of peace. means that they don't have enough uh, either confidence or instrument for them to control um, the prospect of peace with China. So even though they can use DPP, they can elect DPP, or they can purchase more, uh, uh, more arms to protect themselves, they still don't feel a strong advocacy over peace in general. Or they may say, well, you know, everybody come and stand together to say we want unification or we want independence. That would still not persuade China of the use of military means. So it appears that people don't, in general, don't have strong advocacy over peace. But we want to do further analysis to see, oh, this is something interesting. Uh, this has nothing to do with our analysis, but just show you something I think was quite interesting. Uh, the uh, 
first two questions we ask about initiating an independence war and defending uh, Taiwan against China's invasion, uh, you will see uh, about a quarter of the population would go for independence war and defend against China's attack by themselves. Uh, we call this rights to uh, territory. So this is our land. So whatever happened, this is our territory. But then you have people say, no, we don't want to uh, uh, fight the independence war, but we want to defend our land. We call this rights to peace. So we, we want to keep the status quo. And then you have people say, uh, yes, we want to launch independence war, but no, uh, people don't have the right to say uh, uh, no to, to China. Uh, let's see. Oh, oh, here's, I'm sorry, here is the independence war. People say uh, we have to um, go with the government to fight independence war. But, uh, and we should defend our land, even the govern, govern, uh, government gives up. So almost 30% of people say Taiwan has the rise to independence. And the last one is that people should uh, support the government to launch independence war, but people should not defend Taiwan if the government gives up. That's the interesting combination. We call this rise to submission, that means Whatever your leaders tell you to do, you do it. So your leaders tell you to fight independence war, you go for it. Your leaders tell you not to defend against China, you don't defend against China. So we call this rise to submission. Uh, this is just something interesting for you to think. Uh, I want to go further into analysis of the, ten, the result of 10 questions. I run a factual analysis of this uh, 10, the result of these 10 questions. Do people know factual analysis? How many people have taken statistics as your one? Of so we have two experts here. <laughs> uh, <coughs> what we mean by factual analysis is to see when people answer these 10 questions, are there some hidden factor affecting the way people answer these questions? So we try to see the correlation between the way people answer these questions. Do people answer yes to the first question, tend to answer no to the second question? Do people answer yes to the first question, also tend to say no to the, for example, 10th question? If there is such relationship, we think there must be something behind this three question that affecting people's answer to these three questions. It depends how, uh, we don't know how many factors we will get um, when we run the factor analysis. Usually, when we run a factor analysis, we get a correlation uh, over, um, 0 0.30, we would consider there's something there. Okay, so if, if, if five out of 10 questions are correlated with one another uh, with a coefficient higher or greater than 0 0.30, we would tend to consider there's some factor behind these five questions. And in the past, when I work, when I work through factor analysis, Usually, I get coefficient like uh, 0.3 something or 0.4 something. Okay, I then I I take those result as a factor. For some reason, we have almost perfect match here. We have three factors coming out of this factor analysis run by the computer, and their coefficient unanimously, consistently are greater than 0.5. I think that's surprising. I, I have never seen a factor analysis with such wonderful result. Uh, uh, it's, 
it's a happy surprise, but then you don't really know how to make out of it because it's too, it's too perfect sometimes. You don't, <laughs> you don't see these wonderful numbers here. So we have, four, uh, we have three factors. The first factors connect the first five questions here. Okay, let me go through these five questions. If it is the DPP who carries out openness to and, uh, to and exchange with China, people should feel safer. If you say yes, if you have confidence in DPP uh, to carry out openness to China and feel safer, then you will tend also say yes to the following four questions. You will tend to say, Taiwan will become independent eventually. You will tend to say, if the ruling party is DPP, China will not force unification. You will tend also to say, if China resorts to armed unification and the government gives up fighting, the people should continue to fight. And of course, you will also tend to say, yes, the longer the current situation lasts, the more bargaining chips Taiwan will have with China. And the opposite of the story, of course, is that if you say no to the first question, that you don't think the BPP carrying out openness to and exchange with China will make you feel safer, then you will also tend to say no to the question, uh, the following four questions. You will tend to think Taiwan will not become independent eventually. You will tend to think the DPP as a ruling party will not uh, uh, persuade China uh, of uh, unification with force. You will tend to suspect that China's, uh, you will tend to disagree that uh, uh, people have the right to, to deny um, uh, the government's uh, uh, decisions to give up. And you will tend to say no uh, to the question of, uh, of a future bargaining chips uh, of Taiwan uh, be higher uh, as time goes on. So this, these five questions are related to one another. I call these five questions as they are related. Uh, there is a factor behind these five questions affecting people to answer these five questions in a related way. And I call this factor prospect factor. You don't have to call it a prospect. But that's my theoretical tendency. I call it prospect factor, meaning that if people have better prospect for Taiwan's future, for Taiwan's independence, they will answer uh, these five questions in a related way. Or they have terrible prospect for, uh, for Taiwan in the future, they will also answer these five questions in a related way. The second factor we have, look at the number. God, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. This is very uh, unusual, I would say. Look at how this second factor have connected people's way to answer the three questions here. If arms purchase requires a higher tax, people should still support. Yes, we want to buy arms. Doesn't matter how much it costs. If you say yes this way, then you will also say, uh, you will also deny people uh, the rights to say no to the government to launch the independence war. You see the, you see the correlation? If you want to fight uh, China with determination in order to achieve independence, then you would be willing to pay higher tax to purchase arms. Then of course you will pay, uh, you will buy, per buy arms uh, even though it will cause problems with China. So this three makes quite, uh, uh, ma make a big sense together. I call this three question, the factor behind this three question, I call it determination factor. That means you have, you have determination, then you will tend to answer this three question in a correlated way. Either you have stronger determination or you have no determination at all in face of China. The last two questions, which we find together. Uh, note, note that in the first prospect factor, 
we have also a factor here, which is point four, which is very good. The, the, uh, the question is, the majority of Taiwanese express support independence. China will renounce the use of force as a means of unification. That's also, that also belongs to the prospect factor. Okay. And it makes sense, right, uh, compared with all five, five other questions. The last factors come from these two questions. If a majority of Taiwanese expressively supports unification, China will renounce the use of force. If a majority of Taiwanese expressively supports independence, China will renounce the use of force. Both questions. Uh, that means that if you think Taiwanese people come to a consensus about their relationship with China in the future, it doesn't matter whether it is about independence or it is about unification. China will renounce the use of force. Or put it the other way, if you don't think the majority of Taiwan's opinion, if you don't think the consensus of Taiwanese population uh, make any difference, then you will say no to both these two questions. Okay. I call this factor legitimacy factor. In other words, do you have, do you think you have the legitimacy, strong, le strong legitimacy, strong enough to persuade China off the use of force if people come together and uh, stand together with one another? That's the last two questions. We call it the legitimacy factor. And I guess we can easily tell that the majority of the population don't have a good prospect, don't have determination, and don't feel the legitimacy play a role in cross-strait relationship by looking at the result to the 10 questions in general, okay? Since the result, the answer to the 10 questions in general don't show any strong efficacy. However, we know from factor analysis that if people show something uh, positive about their efficacy over peace, then they must have very positive uh, cohesion associated with prospect factor or determination factor or legitimacy factor. That, that is to say, while the general population don't feel positive about the efficacy over peace in their mind vis-a-vis China. But then we know those people who have stronger efficacy must also have higher score on prospect or determination or legitimacy. Right? Even though we don't have a general public supporting or, or feeling good about their efficacy, but we still know when people feel stronger efficacy over the peace, across Taiwan Strait, they come from these three hidden factors behind the 10 questions. So I start curious about who those people are. <laughs> so I run a cluster analysis. Cluster analysis is a little bit different from factor analysis. Factor analysis tells you how uh, how factors behind the questions affecting people answer the question they answer. Cluster analysis tells you how people can be divided into groups who answer the question similarly. So it's not about uh, correlation between, fact between questions. It's about uh, it's about the way people answer questions. So, so we can divide uh, the population into, into a number of groups. Each group has a particular way, a particular style of answering questions. Cluster analysis is a little different from factor analysis because factor analysis, you can basically let a computer run. And the compu computer will automatically run all these uh, correlations and tell you the number then you know how strong 
uh, the factor has been affecting behind the door the way people answer the questions. But a cluster analysis cannot be run automatically by the computer. You have to tell the computer to divide the population into a certain number of groups. For example, you have to say, hey, divide the population into three groups. Then computer would divide the population into three groups in a way that people belonging to each group answering their question in a most similar way. Then you can also ask the computer to divide the population into four, into four groups, five groups, and six groups. And the computer will tell you when it divides population into different number of groups, how well these groups fit statistically. In other words, if you have, if you decide to tell the computer to divide the groups into three, then you may have people uh, answer uh, particular two questions in a very related way, but the third question or the fourth question in a very unsimilar way. So that's not very good fit. So you have to find a number, uh, the number of population uh, that can give you a better picture. Sometimes you don't have better picture anyway. No, doesn't matter how many number you ask computer to divide the population, you don't have good numbers, then you know you don't, you can't have a good cluster. Now I asked the computer to divide it into many different, into three, four, five, six, seven, and eight different groups on the three factors. We have prospect factor, determination factors, and the legitimacy factors. So I asked the computer to divide population into three, four, five, six, seven, and eight um, groups and look at the result. And my God, when I divide the population into five groups, they look just perfect. <laughs> uh, perfect means that in a cluster analysis, again, if you have 0 0.6, 0 0.7, you know, you tend to accept them. It's it's all right, it's not wonderful, but it's all right. You, if you have, if, if you divide it uh, into five groups, the first group score like 0 0.1 and 0 0.1, then 0 0.4, you know, you think it's okay. That's a group. But look at what I get when I ask computer to divide the population into five groups. You have almost every groups associated with all these three factors with a coefficient greater than one. With the only exception of this one, which is almost one, it's just, you can consider it as one. So you have five groups, you, ha you, have, you have five perfectly fit groups, which almost answer, uh, answer their questions on these three factors in a very similar way. The first group don't have good prospect for China, uh, well for Taiwan, but have strong determination and don't think legitimacy counts anything. That's a very weird group, right? No prospect, no legitimacy, but we want to fight anyway. <laughs> That's real independence, <laughs> but pessimistic independence. The second group looks like more like general public, no good prospect, no determination, and no influence of legitimacy. The third group, no good prospect, no determination, but believe that if we can stand together and show China, we have, cons we have reached consensus in Taiwan that may affect China. So the third group has stronger um, um, performance on the legitimacy factor. The first group of good prospect, no determination, and good legitimacy, uh, good performance on legitimacy. This is also a very interesting group because the group basically says, we feel good, we will win, so we don't want to fight. <laughs> the fifth group, good prospect, strong determination, and confidence in the influence of legitimacy over cross straight relationship. I think perhaps the sunflower campaigner belongs to the fifth group. 
So they have good prospect with determination and feeling they have legitimacy. Uh, in terms of distribution, I don't have the number here, but basically the population is quite evenly divided between these five groups with, I don't remember which one, uh, the lowest uh, ratio is something like 17 or 18 percent of the population. The highest maybe is 23, 24 percent. So it's basically very evenly divided around one-fifth each takes about one-fifth of population. If you look at the fifth group, which may go out to uh, mobilize people, why they would go out to mobilize people? I think both three, four, and five, group three, group four, and group five may go out to mobilize people because their legitimacy factor is stronger, is positive. Uh, but then uh, you find there is a difficulty for them to mobilize people. If they want to st stress prospect factor, they will alienate the first three groups. If they stress determination factor, they will alienate group two, three, and four. If they stress the legitimacy factor, they will alienate group one and two. So whichev whichever factor you stress in order to enhance the control over cross-relationship in a peaceful way, you will encounter some uh, uh, difficulty among the population because there's always some a portion of population cannot be mobilized uh, by one of these factors. But anyway, what we get from this statistic exercise is that we know the psychological mechanism to lead people into confrontational approach with China has to do with their sense of prospect, sense of control over their future, with their determination, whether they think they want to uh, take stronger stand against China, and also with the legitimacy factor, whether or not they can persuade population in Taiwan to stand together in order to show a consensus so that to persuade or convince China from uh, violence, uh, means of, uh, violent means of uh, unification. So if you, when people ask, all right, you have a balance of relationship theory. You have an asymmetrical relationship. You have weaker power, sometimes willing to challenge the stronger power. But explain to me why and how the weaker power sometimes choose the confrontational policy, sometimes choose not. How the weaker power comes to the judgment that they can resort to force. Um, theoretically, we say the weaker power must have judged that the stronger power significantly violate the reciprocal relationship between the two. So the weaker power want to send a strong signal to the stronger power. If you don't give up, if you don't comp compromise, I will be your trouble forever in the future. So you better think twice. Okay. That's the theoretical rationale for the weaker power to confront the stronger power if they think, if the weaker power thinks the reciprocal stability has been violated. But then what's the psychological mechanism leading them to think that they can really, um, if not coerce, at least convince the stronger party away from taking a punitive sanction as a return? And the answer lies in, in these three factors from social surveys. So if we look at the relationship between North Korea and China, between Vietnam and China, or between Philippines and China, then we ask, we can ask the same question. These are not, although these three factors come from survey in Taiwan, but they are, they are about relationship between 
different psychological processes. They're not, this relationship of psychological process has nothing to do with Taiwan. It's coming from relationship between questions. It's not coming from Taiwan spe special condition uh, directly. It's coming from the relationship between questions. So it can be possibly universally applied. So we can also argue from this statistical analysis that uh, when Philippines challenged China, uh, either Philippines has support from the United States, and this analysis has uh, is irrelevant. If you have a support from the United States specifically, then the analysis is irrelevant. If Philippines willing to challenge China without without the support of the United States, then Philippines must have strong determination strong determination to do that. And I don't th see that's likely. I don't see most Philippines has strong de determination to fight China over small islands. Then you must have strong consensus that people believe the legitimacy can force China to retreat. That's possible if you have, through a democratic process, gather a consensus, then you may support the government in Philippines to take confrontational approach on China. And of course, if you feel stronger prospect of winning over, a uh, uh, win over China by yourself, uh, then you will take stronger position. I don't see that happening in Philippines. So if the Philippines will challenge China without the support of the United States, I would say it probably comes from the legitimacy factor. If um, um, Vietnam want to challenge China, that comes from, that could have both a determination factor and legitimacy factor. Plus fact factor, maybe a little bit, because for 2,000 years in history, Vietnam has dealt with China, if not successfully, but at least uh, quite, uh, um, uh, I would say, impressively. There had been only six major wars fought over 2,000 years between China and, China and Vietnam. So I would say perhaps prospect Prospect factor could also play a role, but determination factor and legitimacy factor could be stronger. But legitimacy factor might not come from democratic process. After all, Vietnam was sti is still a communist country as a one-party rule country. So legitimacy factor must be ex expressed in other ways. Uh, it appears to me that the legitimacy factor was not really all that strong in the earlier exchange this year and, the, and last year between China and Vietnam, uh, since there has been all kinds of domestic um, uh, disagreement how to deal with China. So legitimacy factor may not play a role in Vietnam, but the determination factor and the prospect factor may play a role. So that's the kind of analysis we could use to study a particular, how a particular weaker party, weaker neighbor of China willingly resorting to confrontational policy on China uh, uh, through the uh, use of these psychological factors. All right, that's what I want to share with you uh, today. And we can